here to talk to you about using DNA origami as a technique for the formation of 3D chiral nanostructures or surface plasmon resonance. Now this sounds really complicated, and it is, but don't worry, I'm going to break it down for you and make it so you can understand what this is saying, why it's so important, and why it's pretty cool as well. So what is surface plasmon resonance, or SPR? Well, it's the collective oscillation of the free electrons of a material in a resonant frequency with an incoming light wave. And this causes the propagation of energy from that light wave along the surface of that material. SPR being defined, I'm going to go through the major events leading up to the paper I'm going to analyze. We'll start with 1952. So, in 1952, doctors Pines and Bohm studied electron-rich gas. They were looking for changes in density throughout the gas when it was irradiated with light. And what they discovered was electrons moved in two distinct ways. The first one was the random thermal oscillation of electrons. Some electrons moved up, some electrons moved down. There were minor fluctuations in the density of electrons in the gas, but nothing noteworthy. This was expected. Random thermal motion occurs in all substances, and this gas was no different. That's just Brownian motion. However, there was a second kind of electron movement, which was unexpected. And this was the collective motion of electrons with the light wave. They would see major changes in electron densities as all electrons moved up or down at once. This is a type of plasma oscillation, they called it, and it was a new discovery. Pines and Bohm being covered, we'll now move on to 1957. So, in 1957, Dr. R. H. Ritchie took a look at Pines and Bohm's work and thought there was something there. So he decided to expand on it. He took thin metal films and irradiated them with various frequencies of light. And when he observed the motion of the surface electrons in these films, what he found was that they oscillated as a group. They moved as a group and propagated the energy from the light wave along the surface of those films. And he coined this motion as the surface plasmon, this electron oscillation, really becoming the father of SPR. The work from this time sort of stalled, but that was because it was relying on classical physics. In the 70s, quantum mechanics became the next big thing, so the work picked up again. Using this quantum mechanical approach, there was tremendous progress made in the investigation of the surface plasmon. There was a very talented group of physical chemists who were really leading this front, but in particular, Dr. Peter Feibelman made a series of equations to model the surface plasmon. He was really looking into the role of dipoles and wave numbers. And that is what his most important equation, which is shown here, displays. With SPR being properly modeled, researchers began applying it. So, what were these applications? Well, initially, SPR was used for the detection of thin organic films along the surface of nanoparticles. It was then used to characterize the surface of electrodes, specifically what electrolytes were there and at what concentration. It was also used for gas sensing, detecting how much of a specific gas was at an interface. But in 1983, Dr. Lydberg came up with a particularly useful approach when he used SPR for biosensing. He created a glass metal interface, and to the metal, he attached antigens. Now, he would shine light off of this interface, and it would create SPR along the surface of the metal. However, when antibodies came and attached to the antigens, the electron surface of the metal would change slightly. Thus, the SPR would be slightly different. 
so he was able to detect the attachment of antibodies to antigens. Here we see some more modern uses for SPR. There's the propagation of light along a 40 nanometer channel patterned with gold nanoparticles. It's been used in solar cells to construct nanoscale circuits. It's been used to create hot spots, which by focusing the energy from incoming visible light actually produces soft x-rays. And it's been used for biodetection with agglomerates of nanoparticles grouping together to produce red shifts that can be detected. There's clearly a large variance of applications for SBR, but how do we make the structures for them? Top-down approaches have traditionally been used with lithography as the main method. Lithography is essentially the deposition of material onto a surface, oftentimes using multiple layers that are removed or etched to create features or arrange materials. Electron or ion beam lithography provides the most control, allowing for nanoscale resolution, but is both costly and difficult to perform over a large area. Different, cheaper lithography methods have thus been developed. Here we see nanosphere lithography, where spheres are laid onto a surface, the material, in this case gold, is deposited around them, the spheres are removed, and the gold is heated to form clusters. The problem here is that that scale bar is 200 nanometers. The cheaper approaches just don't offer enough precision, and all methods of lithography have difficulty making 3D structures. So how are we going to combat these challenges? Well, in 2006, DNA origami was shown to be able to make structures accurate on the nanoscale. Paul Rothman pioneered the technique of DNA origami with his 2006 Nature publication. He took one very long single-stranded DNA, a scaffold strand, folded it into a variety of shapes, and then held it in those shapes using Watson Crick base pairing with shorter DNA strands, staple strands. You can think of it like taking a really long rope, folding it into a variety of different shapes, and then holding it in those shapes using a bunch of zip ties. Another way to think of it is it's like making DNA balloon animals. So DNA origami also allows for the attachment of a variety of materials at programmable locations. So it could be a viable bottom-up approach for the formation of nanoscale 3D surface plasmon resonance structures. So, there we leave off. SPR proving to be an extremely useful technique, but without a good method to make it. DNA origami being a nano-accurate method to form 3D structures. The two seem like a match made in heaven. And Dr. Anton Kuzik decided to combine the two. Dr. Kuzik designed a 24 helix DNA origami bundle with single-stranded DNA stalks projecting from nine points along the bundle in either a right or a left-handed corkscrew pattern. Gold nanoparticles were attached to single-stranded attachment DNA strands via thiol modifications. These attachment strands were designed to Watson-Crick base pair with the stalks protruding from the 24 helix bundle. An excess of these gold nanoparticle DNA hybrids were added to the solution, such that all possible binding sites will be occupied. And sure enough, this strategy produced a percent yield of between 96% and 98%. Transition electron microscopy, or TEM, images were obtained of the structures. And you can see here that the 24 helix bundle formed properly, and the gold nanoparticles, those are those black dots, attached properly. That scale bar is 100 nanometers, so they're of the proper size and shape. And you can see those gold nanoparticles go around the structure in a corkscrew-like pattern. Looks like a barbershop pole. And this shows that the chirality of the structure was correct. These actually have a left-handed or right-handed twist. So we've demonstrated dense decoration for this sample, but how do you know I'm not just cherry picking this image? How do you know the whole solution looks like this? Well, that's what we got other techniques for. And circular dichroism, or CD, was the chosen method of analysis for the whole solution. So what is CD? What does it tell us? What does it do? 
First of all, we're all familiar with linearly polarized light. Essentially, you shine light through a filter called a linear polarizer, and it only allows light of a specific orientation to come through. Now, what if you took this linear polarizer and rotated it clockwise or counterclockwise, left-handed or right-handed? Well, then you would achieve light polarized in a left or right-handed fashion. And chiral substances will absorb left-handed polarized light and right-handed polarized light differently based on their chirality. And this differentiation in absorption can be measured and used to produce a CD spectra, which is unique for specific molecules. Thus, by obtaining the CD spectra for an entire solution, you can obtain features for that entire solution, not just a specific area. Theoretical estimates of the CD spectra were made for 10 nanometer and 16 nanometer gold nanoparticles. Then they were run through the CD device and experimental data was obtained. The theoretical charts are B and D, the experimental are A and C, uh, the charts corresponding to 10 nanometers are A and B, and 16 nanometers are C and D. The blue line corresponds to the right-handed helices, and the red line to the left-handed helices. So, the 16 nanometer particles were expected and observed to produce an amplified peak via the dipole theory. I'll explain that in a little bit. And a redshift, as greater propagation of the light along the structure can be obtained. The experimental data matched well with what was expected from the theoretical predictions. The signature bisignate peak, I'll explain that also soon, for helices was obtained at the resonant frequency for gold with the left-handed and right-handed helices as vertical opposites. This result is significant for two main reasons. First of all, it tells you that I was telling the truth. The structures did form properly throughout the entire solution. Secondly, and more importantly, the SPR wasn't occurring properly. So why is this one more important? Well, it proves that when using DNA origami to form structures with gold nanoparticles, all the theory for SPR still holds true, meaning they can be used in the same applications and even new ones that have been predicted based on theory. So, why is that dip peak or peak dip shape on the CD spectra obtained? Well, that's just the inherent CD spectra of helices. It has to do with the wave from the CD propagating along the z-axis and the xy-axis, and those being differentially absorbed. Here we see the CD spectra raw for the left-handed helices. The xy-axis produces a positive peak initially, and the z-axis produces a negative peak, and the splitting between these two causes the two different peaks. When combined, they look like this, which is the spectra we got. Now, another feature is that larger nanoparticles produce a larger amplitude. Additionally, tighter helices, though not investigated, will produce the same larger amplitude. And this has to do with something called dipole theory. So, the proportion of the CD signal depends on A0, which is the size of the nanoparticles, and RD, which is the radius of the helices. So you decrease the radius, the signal goes up. You increase the size of the nanoparticles, the signal goes up. And it has to do with the propagation of the light wave along all of the nanoparticles. The larger they are, the more interaction there is and the larger signal you get. Two solutions of 10 nanometer gold nanoparticles, we'll call them solution A and solution B for simplicity's sake, were then plated with different materials. Solution A was plated with silver and solution B with a silver gold alloy, both with electroless deposition. These two solutions were then put on left-handed DNA origami helices. A third solution, solution C, was made by creating a 2 to 3 ratio mixture of silver plated to silver gold alloy plated 
helices. Silver plating was expected to produce a blue shift in the CD spectra because its resonant frequency for SPR is at a shorter wavelength than gold. Theoretical predictions were also made for the 2 to 3 ratio solution, but not for the other solutions, as they would just be compared to the 2 to 3 ratio solution. It was expected that more silver in the solution would create a larger blue shift. And sure enough, that's what the experimental data showed. In this figure, the red line corresponds to the gold nanoparticle helix shown before, the green line corresponds to the gold-silver alloy, the dashed black line is the theoretical prediction for the 2 to 3 mixture, the solid black line is the actual spectra obtained for the 2 to 3 mixture, there's actually fantastic agreement there, and the blue line corresponds to the only silver-plated solution. And as you can see, more silver produced a larger blue shift with all peaks having approximately the same shape. This result is fantastic as it shows that SPR doesn't just work for DNA origami with gold, it works for DNA origami with other materials as well. Electroless metal deposition with an excess of silver ions was performed on the 10 nanometer gold nanoparticles. This was done to form a very thick shell of silver around the particles. So much so that when patterned on the helix, the nanoparticles were almost touching. Both left and right handed helices were patterned with these nanoparticles and the CD spectra obtained. As expected by the dipole theory, the signal was massively amplified and as predicted by the use of silver, the signal was also blue shifted. This result proves that SPR with DNA origami works for nanoparticles even at very large sizes in very close orientations. An optical rotary dispersion experiment was performed to image the samples. This sounds really complicated, but all it really means is that the effect the samples had on linearly polarized light was tested. As demonstrated in the schematic, a drop from a right-handed gold nanoparticle helix solution, a left-handed gold nanoparticle helix solution, and a solution with no helices to control were deposited on a glass slide. Linearly polarized light was used to irradiate the samples, and a second linear polarizer was used to select for light shifted in a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion. A charge couple device, CCD, camera was used to capture light at wavelengths above 560 nanometers, aka the red band of light. Right-handed helices were expected to rotate linearly polarized light at wavelengths above 560 nanometers clockwise, and left-handed helices were expected to rotate it counterclockwise. The control, having no chirality, was expected to produce no change. Thus, when the clockwise rotation was selected for, the right-hand helix was expected to produce a signal on the red band. And when the counterclockwise rotation was selected for, the left-handed helix was expected to produce a signal in the red band. Never was the control expected to produce a signal in the red band. An image of the results from the CCD camera is right next to the schematic, and as you can see, they are exactly what was predicted. This is kind of like the final and ultimate demonstration that SPR really does occur correctly with these DNA origami gold nanoparticles constructs. Three different images, DEM, CD, and optical rotary dispersion are pretty indisputable. So DNA origami has successfully been decorated with nanoparticles and they've been shown to exhibit surface plasmon resonance as expected. Now, why is this so important? Well, it vastly improves uh, former applications and provides a new range of applications which previously would have never have been available because the 3D structures and the nanoscale control were not afforded by lithography. But with DNA origami, they are. The new and improved techniques 
can be divided into five basic groups, shown in this diagram here. We'll be going through each one explaining what it is and giving some examples of it. First off, we'll cover A, conformational changes. DNA origami can undergo conformational changes that are often reversible. This feature allows for changes in structure based on changes in the local environment. These can be things like salt level, temperature, or pH. Changes can also be obtained by the application of certain stimuli. These stimuli are particularly interesting because they can be essentially whatever you want. They can be the response to reaching a certain type of cell. This is particularly useful in drug delivery, the insertion of a certain chemical into the solution, or adding other different DNA, RNA, or PNA strands. Conformational changes have even been induced by simply irradiating the samples with visible light. These conformational changes can bring species closer together to interact, like propagating SPR, move them further apart to reduce SPR, or induce certain reactions. In the image shown here, two 24 helix bundles were attached together and both attached to gold nanorods. By adding different fuel strands into the solution, researchers were able to change the angle between the two bundles with great control. And by analyzing the effects of this rotation on the SPR of the nanorods, the degree and angle of rotation was successfully detected demonstrating the tunability of the construct. Conformational changes being covered, we'll move on to B, the attachment of multiple different substituents. So, we've seen the dense decoration of DNA origami constructs with one type of material, but by programming different attachment sites differently, multiple types of substituents can be attached with nanoscale precision. This feature allows for the use of DNA origami as a kind of breadboard, almost, for the attachment of various nanoparticles, the interactions of which can be studied. In the paper this image is from, DNA origami was used to arrange metal nanoparticles, quantum dots, and organic dyes in planet-satellite-type constructs with tunable stoichiometry. This particular image is of a gold nanoparticle surrounded by silver nanoparticles. Using this arrangement, both short and long-range interactions between the nanoparticles, dyes, and dots in the construct were observed. This result suggests a large range of future applications, with one being the tunable interaction of different SPR materials. Now we'll move on to C, unique 3D shapes and structures. DNA origami allows for great variation in the size, shape, and orientation of constructs. This doesn't really sound that impressive based on what we've seen, but the mere ability to have nanoscale control to such a high degree really is astounding. And it's not just helices that can be made. This image is from a similar study to that examined. DNA origami was used to construct left and right-handed chiral tetramers of gold nanoparticles, which were then analyzed using SPR with CD to display the predicted effects. Thus, the chiral arrangements can be made in a variety of manners for SPR. From there, we'll move on to D, biosensors. Biosensors relying on SPR can also be vastly improved by the use of DNA origami. Gold nanorods have been wrapped in DNA origami structures with capture strands patterned on the outside to allow for the affinity attachment of other species. DNA nanostructures have been used in conjunction with silver nanoparticles for the ultra-sensitive detection of microRNAs. And going beyond just direct usage, structures analogous to biological species have been assembled and used for comparative analysis. In this image, we see a DNA origami construct of coupled gold nanoparticles that have been used to make a nanoantenna to enhance fluorescent signals when attached to biomolecular assays. From there we move on to the last group, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy doesn't need to be fully understood to understand why it's useful. It's a technique that looks for shifts in wavelengths of light 
based on the presence of particular species. And using DNA origami, you can couple SPR materials, which sort of acts to enhance the signal coming from a particular area. And this image is of a nano antenna made in such a manner. This degree of control for DNA origami also makes SPR constructs open for the possibility of analysis of single molecules without labels. So, in summary, by patterning DNA origami with nanoparticles, Anton Kuzik provided a major step forward in the world of surface plasmon resonance technology.